Well, good morning. And welcome as we are gathered in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, perhaps you were able to hear some of that music uh, as we were watching the leaves. Um, it comes from the Middle Ages. Um, it's church music from the Middle Ages. Um, of course, it's in Latin, uh, the primary language of the church in that time. And it, it's an invitation for the Spirit to come. Come, Holy Spirit. In the book of 1 Peter, um, Peter begins with this greeting to the church that has been, the church that has been scattered and separated. Um, he refers to them as exiles, no, no doubt as a result of uh, persecution at that time. Um, so they're, they're not together, um, and they're not able to meet in the way that they would normally meet. Um, maybe that sounds familiar. Uh, and the first thing he reminds them is that God has chosen them that they are indeed the church, God's family, regardless of whether they are separated by persecution or, or exile or pandemic. So listen to God's welcome this morning as we come. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, or perhaps we would say to God's elect, separated by pandemic throughout the areas of Toronto and York Region, Durham, Florida, the UK, and wherever else you may be joining us from this morning, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And with Isaiah, we respond Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you.
sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in the morning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting
the psalmist we read, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And as we come to bring our confession this morning, may we be led in the way everlasting. This morning our confession prayer comes from Psalm 51. So I'll read or pray this, uh, lead, lead our prayer time um, with this, the language from Psalm 51. Let's pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, in your faithful love. In your great tenderness, wipe away our offenses. Wash us thoroughly from our guilt and purify us from our sin. For we are well aware of our offenses. Our sin is constantly in mind. Against you and you alone we have sinned. We have done what you see to be wrong that you may show your saving justice when you pass sentence and your victory may appear when you give judgment. Remember, we were born guilty, a sinner from the moment of conception, but you delight in sincerity of heart and in secret you teach us wisdom. And in the stillness, you're invited to bring your own confession. Create in me a clean heart and renew within me a resolute spirit. Do not thrust me away from your presence. Do not take away from me your spirit of holiness, but give me back the joy of your salvation. Sustain in me a generous spirit. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will speak out your praise. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. hear the good news from the book of 1 Peter that we read from earlier this morning, this reminder of who we are in Jesus Christ, who we are, that God tells us who we are and not just who we say we are. Peter writes, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In Jesus Christ, you have received mercy. Your sins are forgiven. We proclaim this truth to one another in the reminder of our of who we are before God and one another as a forgiven people and a forgiving people. Having received Christ's forgiveness, having received his peace, of course, we take this opportunity to share it with those around us. So you are invited. Open up your microphones. Greet one another as you pass the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. 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 Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Christ. Peace of 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 Christ. God bless you all. God bless Peace of Christ be with you. Bye, family.
Good morning, children of Bridalwood. I hope you're all doing well today. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Thank you for nodding. <laughs> all right, today we're continuing on with our theme, Thanksgiving. Um, I know it's not Thanksgiving anymore in Canada this month, um, but I think still it's definitely a good practice to continue to practice Thanksgiving when we can. Um, so, the theme for the month is called Shout Out. And what that's all about is shouting out and letting people know that you're thankful. And the verse for this month, could I have the next slide? Is taken from Psalm 136, verse one. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Today's Bible story is about David. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, we all know that David was just a shepherd boy when God told him that he would be king of all of Israel, but it would be many years before that actually happened. David spent a lot of time on the run from King Saul before he actually became king. Our Bible story today picks up at the point in David's story in the book of 2 Samuel, verse, I mean, 2 Samuel chapters 5 and 6, where David had finally become king of God's people. 
Even though David had finally become king, something was still missing from Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant. Can I have the next slide, please? When I say Ark, I'm not talking about Noah's Ark, that giant boat uh, holding lots of different animals. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden chest covered in gold with the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments and other special objects inside. In some special way, God's presence was with the ark. And when the Israelites had the ark, they knew that God was with them. The special ark of the covenant had been captured by the Philistines, then returned to God's people. And it was sitting in the home of a man named Obed Edom. Now David wanted the ark but brought back to Jerusalem, the city of the king. And he wanted to set up a special tent for the ark to be kept in because the ark was very holy. So David gathered his best soldiers and marched to the place where the ark uh, rested. His soldiers lifted the ark with the carrying poles like God had told them to, and they began carrying it back to Jerusalem. But you know what? Could I have the next slide? Thank you. David was so, so very joyful and thankful that the ark was returning to Jerusalem that he didn't just march. This is what the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. It says this, wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound, sound of trumpets. David was dancing with all his might before the Lord. Have you ever danced with all your might because you were so joyful and thankful? Now, if we were at church, I'd ask you all to get up and dance right now, but I won't do that. And the Bible says David was wearing something called a linen ephod. Usually, a linen ephod was a garment worn by priests. Some people think David's linen ephod was a type of undergarment worn under outward clothing. So David wasn't wearing his proper royal kingly robes when he was dancing with all his might. So the people were celebrating together. Everyone was excited. Everyone except one person. It was King David's wife, Michael. And this is what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 16 and 20. Could I have the next slide, please? As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Wow. Okay. So Michael, his wife, was not very happy about what had happened. But then David said to his wife, Michael, that he danced this way to celebrate and honor the Lord and that he was willing to be undignified and humiliate himself if it brought more honor to God. Michael and David cared about different things. Michael thought that the way things appeared on the outside to others was more important, but David thought it was important to celebrate what God has done. That's why he danced in front of everyone. His heart was full of gratitude because God's Ark of the Covenant had finally returned to Jerusalem. God had done great things for his people and has done great things for his people all throughout history. And he's done really amazing things for you and me too. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, it's easy to look at how things appear on the outside right now and feel disappointed that we can't be together and celebrate with others on the outside externally. Yes, we can feel disappointed, but we need to remind ourselves and each other that God has done so many amazing things for all of us. And I bet each of us here could share a story about something really great that God has done in their lives, even something like giving us a family or giving us good friends. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Now, we can take time during our day to pause and just remember how good has God has been to us. We can read his story in the Bible. We can listen to songs that remind us of God. We can pray with our family and thank God for our food before we eat a meal. We can say and do kind things for our family and friends with a thankful heart because this shows our thanks thankfulness. And at night, as you get ready for bed, you can share about how God provided things for your life that day. There are so many ways that we can celebrate what God has done. David didn't hold back. He celebrated what, it got, what God had done in a big way. And the greatest thing God has done for us was to come when he sent Jesus to be our savior. Because of that, we know we can trust him no matter what, that God kept his promises and continues to do so. We can trust him to send his only son to be our savior, and we can trust him with everything in our lives. So could I have the next slide, please? So let's remember that we can celebrate what God has done. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our savior. And though things can be a little confusing and a lot different right now, help us to remember to take each time, take time each day to remember and to give thanks for all the ways that you have shown your blessing and your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, and Ken, thank you for uh, leading us in that time of worship. And uh, for all the rest of the Bridalwood family, uh, thank you uh, for being here today. It's good to see all of you uh, on screen. I also noticed some names uh, and some screens who I don't recognize. And so uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we just wanna welcome you and uh, we're glad uh, that you're here and hope that this time of worship would be mutually edifying and encouraging uh, for all of us. And so welcome. Our scripture lesson today uh, is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 39, verses 19 to 23. Okay. So as you all know, we have been journeying through the book of uh, Genesis for some time. And so today and then uh, next week will be the uh, last uh, of the uh, messages uh, from Genesis uh, before we now head into the Advent season. And so uh, taken from Genesis chapter 39, verses 19 to 23. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. This is a word of the Lord for us this morning. Friends, as we continue to hear for God's word this morning, why don't we pray together and then let's gather our hearts. Our Heavenly Father, in the reading of Scripture, let us hear your voice. In our reflection on your word, let us know your will. Then in the living of our lives, let us show your love. We pray in the name of Jesus, your living word. Amen. Well, friends, uh, we are now entering into sort of the large uh, and last of the narratives in the book of Genesis. Uh, so we've heard stories of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and a good chunk of story from Jacob. And now we're hearing uh, the story of uh, Joseph narratives. And uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. And uh, for those of you who've done your Bible study this week, you come to realize that Joseph was so affectionately um, uh, identify with his technicolor dream coat or multicolor dream coat. Uh, we found out in the Bible, it doesn't say multicolor dream coat, right? What does the Bible say about Joseph? He just wore an ornamented robe, 
right? So often uh, we think uh, we know certain things, but we realize it's more of a cultural take rather than what's actually in the source. And so I'm sure that clothing, uh, what he wore, it's not a big deal, but still, I think it goes to show the point that sometimes what we think is what's in the Bible might not be. So uh, it, it's really important that we do uh, get the facts straight. Um, as many of you know, just before this incident of Joseph that we find him in Egypt, uh, we do need to go back. Joseph was the 11th of the 12 children that was born to Jacob. So out of all the sons that Joseph, uh, Sir Jacob had, uh, Joseph was one of the youngest. And um, Joseph was also the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And, and so his affection for Joseph was great. And even though he had 12 sons, he treated Joseph with uh, special treatment uh, that outweighed any kind of favor and love that he bestowed upon any other children. And so Joseph being still quite young and not fully mature and not knowing what that favoritism, how that affected his other siblings, he just basked it all in and felt that he was special. He was 17 years old at the time, uh, at the beginning when we sort of pick him up before he was sold to Egypt. At that point, he had a very good childhood. We're told that he was good looking. Uh, his father bestowed him much uh, privilege and wealth. And so Joseph's future looked bright. And uh, even though there were 12 sons, Joseph was like the foreman of all the brothers, right? Um, and uh, his dad didn't show, uh, didn't try to hide uh, his favoritism for Joseph. And so at that young age, he probably just felt that he was very special that he was actually better than his brothers and he thought he did everything better, that he thought he was smarter, he thought he was faster, he thought he was better looking and he thought he probably had a better future than all the other brothers. And so, you know, his five, father's favoritism actually put Joseph in danger that they both could not see. Uh, Jacob places Joseph as a foreman of his brothers, like the manager of his brothers and often Joseph would go on to do job evaluation of his brother, uh, the rest of the shepherds. And not only that, Joseph would bring those reports to his father. And um, he also would bring bad report. And, and maybe it would have been a little bit more palatable if Joseph was not the 11th in the rank of age among Jacob's 12. But being one of the youngest uh, put in that position, uh, the brothers just hated him even more. And what really took it over the top was back in these days, they felt that God spoke to people or revealed his will through dreams. And do you remember the dream that Joseph had? Well, Joseph had this dream where, you know, they were in a field and his sheaf of grain just rose up. And then rest of the 11 brother sheaves also surrounded him, surrounded his sheaf, and they started to bow down to it. And uh, Joseph had the gall to share this dream with the rest of the brothers. And uh, he thought they would be just as happy for him and excited uh, for him as well. But was that the case? No, they hated him even all the more for it. And I guess Joseph was a little bit tone deaf at this point because he didn't really seem to figure out how all this favoritism and his dreams were affecting his brother. And to make the situation worse, Joseph has another dream, and this time it's not sheaves that are rising up in the field, bowing down to Joseph's sheaves. He had a dream that the stars, the sun, and the moon were also bowing down to him. And he said to his brothers, isn't this great? And uh, the brothers, they finally had this Popeye moment. Remember uh, the cartoon, the Popeye the Sailor Man? And uh, one of his favorite saying, he says, Blow me down. That's all I can stand because I can't stand no more. Right? Dubious grammar, I know. Uh, but whenever somebody uh, mess with his love, his girlfriend, Olive, uh, you know, Popeye would say, that's all I can stand because I can't stand no more. And, you know, he would go crazy, eat that uh, can of spinach, and it would be lights up for everybody that got in his way. Well, Jacob's other boys, 
Joseph's siblings, they had enough. All this favoritism, all this bad job evaluation that he was reporting to his dad, and now this dream about him lording over them, this is enough. And, and so when Jacob sent down on this final assignment, where Joseph, the foreman, came to give a job evaluation, they looked up and saw Joseph from afar. And, and they started to plot this idea to kill him uh, once and for all and get rid of Joseph because they can't stand him no more. And uh, so as he approached Reuben, the oldest tried to deter them, but to no avail. And they grabbed this Joseph. And if you, if you read the narrative carefully, uh, you know, they say this, let's kill him and see what comes of his dream. So Joseph's dreams bother them. The fact that he dreamt a similar dream, not only once, but twice, it, it felt like it was a confirmation and that God would actually bring this to pass. And so they were even more upset and they were jealous of this dream. And so they said, let's get rid of him and see what may come of his dream. And when Joseph did also come, do you see the action that they took that's recorded in the scripture? Do you remember what they did to Joseph? They stripped him of his ornamented robe. Because that ornamented robe, it, it, it stood for something. All that it stands for, they couldn't stand it no more. How would you like it? If your dad or your mom bought your siblings Canada Goose Jacket, and for you, hey, let's go to the Sears Clearance Outlet and uh, get you uh, a no brand name uh, jacket for you. So they get a thousand dollar jacket, nice winter jacket for your sibling, but for you, eh, twenty dollar used jacket from the Goodwill store or something like that. How would that make you feel? Well, the brothers, they didn't feel so good. Uh, it just made them always feel second best. And uh, no matter how hard they try to please their dad and try to win his favor, they would never be accepted by their dad like Joseph. And so they got rid of that robe and they could not get rid of that fast enough. So they took Joseph and threw him into an empty cistern or a well, if you will. And so imagine if you're Joseph, how horrified and bewildered and scared you would have been. He was only 17. What do you know at 17? I know all of you back when you were 17, you thought you knew everything, thought you were invincible. The world was your oyster and everything to conquer a bright future ahead of you until you come across something bigger than you. You're no longer in control. You're all alone and afraid. And there's nobody to rescue you. But later on, as they were sitting down and eating like nothing had happened, Judah says, well, what will we gain if we're to kill our brothers and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him uh, to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. Well, after all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. Gee, Judah, thanks. You're all heart. How kind of you. You will not kill me. You will just sell me as a slave. Man, brothers like that, who needs enemies, right? Uh, but that's how much they hated Joseph and the situation that they were in. And uh, what's really upsetting, and for all of you who've had your hearts broken, I'm almost certain that it was broken because it came from somebody so close to you. Uh, the sense of betrayal by someone that are close to you are probably one of the most difficult things that a human heart can endure. But if it has ever happened to you, you're not the first one. It's happened to Joseph. It's happened to many. Maybe some of you had a bad breakup before. Maybe some of you, when you still think about that 
nasty boyfriend who cheated on you that made you felt so betrayed. Maybe words that come out that you cannot unmute your speaker while you're on Zoom with your church family. Uh, maybe you think about a girlfriend or somebody that hurt you really bad or a brother or a sister or a mom or dad. Unfortunately, all the most difficult pain that we endure in life comes at the hands of the people often closest to us. And this is how Joseph ended up uh, in Egypt. But in the face of this adversity, Joseph did not crumble. And that's why he is remembered and that's why this story continues. If you think about all the heroes that you've ever admired, isn't it about overcoming challenges and difficulties in life? That people that we admire and, and people that we want to emulate and to become like, if you think about it, they're people who have all overcome struggles and difficulties in life. And so let's learn from Joseph, uh, what did he do when he faced adversity? In the face of adversity, number one, Joseph maintained a clear conscience. I, I think that means something. I know when things have gone bad, when you feel like you kept your integrity and you kept a clean conscience and you feel right before God. It gives you a kind of a fuel to keep going, uh, that there isn't this sense of disappointment in yourself. You're disappointed in the situation, but you feel that you can still come to God with confidence and with clear conscience that God, but I'm still trying my best. In the light of that, God, I feel like you've maintained my integrity. And even though this difficulty has come before me and other people may not understand and other people might misunderstand me and misrepresent me, God, you know me and you know my heart. And having that clear conscience and having somebody at least knowing that God knows your honesty and integrity, that gives us energy and fuel and kind of a confidence that I'm sure all of you have experienced. And so look at Joseph uh, in Potiphar's household. We're told that Joseph was well-built and handsome. And, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph, said, Joseph, come to bed with me. Uh, pretty bold, isn't it? So far, it's all the men that are getting into trouble uh, because their advances here in the book of Genesis but this time, it's actually a woman making an advancement on Joseph. Whereas other people have failed, Joseph actually is passing with flying colors. He, he says, he, he refused Potiphar's wife and said, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. So with all that trust his master has given to him, how, how can I betray him? And he says, no one is greater in this house than I am in verse 9. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Then how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You notice that when Joseph kept a clear conscience, he kept that clear conscience. Why? Because he knew ultimately the judge of his life was not Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, not even himself, but the ultimately, the one who would grade his homework, the one who would grade how he lived his life is God Almighty. He knew that he could never fool God, and he respected God enough that he didn't want to sin against God. So friends, Joseph kept a clear conscience uh, by overcoming all the suffering uh, in the world, by keeping a clear conscience before God. And, and number two, it's so easy for people to start thinking, woe is me, why me, why is this happening to me? And, and complain all of these things. But, you know, 
In the words of Helen Keller, she said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And as C.S. Lewis said, well, why not? Why not suffering come upon the righteous? Because it's the only righteous who could handle it, right? Uh, and and it, it's just showing us that we can overcome these things, that they've also seen the benefits of the struggles, and, and they've seen so many people overcome it. And Joseph didn't crumble. But even in the midst of it, he knew God was with him, and he lived in the face of God. And, and, and so even the prison was a very dreary place. And he was in prison for falsely being accused of something he didn't do. Even in prison, Joseph did his best and he won the favor of the prison warden. So friends, maybe you've been demoted. Maybe you've been put into a situation where it was less than where you were before. But what if that's part of God's plan? What if... God's will for you in that situation is not to complain and keep living in the past of what you had, what could have been, and what you lost. But what if we are to be faithful in the present moment, right? Why do so many of you love dogs, right? I've heard so many people say, aren't dogs wonderful? Because they just live in the present moment right? They don't care about what you did before. They don't care what you did in the past, what you're thinking, what you're going to do in the future. You know, they, they say dogs are such great pets because they live in the moment. And uh, Joseph, he lived in the moment and he was faithful to the Lord. He didn't keep complaining about it, how his brothers had sold him. He didn't complain, keep talking about how unfair he, life has treated him. He was doing his best and he knew that God was with him. So Aparna Bailey uh, visited an orange grove uh, where an irrigation pump had broken down. Uh, the season was unusually dry and, and some of the trees were beginning to die uh, for lack of water. The man giving the tour uh, then took, to, took Bailey to his own orchard where irrigation was used sparingly. Uh, these trees could go without rain for another two weeks, he said. And, and the man was very surprised. Uh, but he explained, you see, when they were young, I frequently kept water from them. This hardship caused them to send their roots deeper into the soil and each in search of moisture. Now, mine are the deepest rooted trees in the area. While others are being scorched by the sun, these trees are finding moisture at a greater depth than all the other trees. Do you believe when we are in the face of adversity and we are doing our best, do you believe it's like us that God's growing our spiritual roots to go deep, to depend on God and to trust in God that is maturing us, that when we overcome such adversities, we start to grow a good, thick spiritual skin, that little bumps and cracks on the road, it doesn't bother us anymore. That the trust that we develop through these school of hard knocks, it toughens us, strengthens us, so that we don't grow into a bunch of weaklings but God grows us into champions and God strengthens us so that we can weather all the storms that come our way. So imagine this way. You ever, uh, you know, see cracks on the road and little bumps along the way? Which car would feel it more? Cars with a small wheel or a big wheel, right? Cars with small wheels sometimes go through a little crack and they get stuck in them and, and they have a hard time coming out and they feel the bump so much more. But cars with big wheels, trucks, and you know these construction tractors, they just roll over those cracks like nothing, like nothing. Imagine God 
teaches you to do your best in all circumstances. And in so doing, you overcome all the trials and tribulations of life. Later on, all these little cracks that got you stuck in the past, you just roll right over it. And I don't bother you as much anymore because you have learned to trust God and have learned to do your very best in the midst of it. And when you overcome some of these hard trials in life, all the little things, they really are little things and we don't sweat it anymore. So number one, maintain a clear conscience. Number two, keep on doing your very best, even no matter what the circumstances. And number three, lastly, keep walking with God. Practice the presence of God as Joseph did. He remembered that God was with him through prayer, he continued to reach out to God as God reached out to him. And by consciously relying on him, he did his very best, aware that he wasn't serving man, but he was serving God Almighty. That he wasn't serving Potiphar first and foremost. He wasn't serving the prison world first and foremost, but he was serving the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of Israel, that God, he was serving the God Almighty, the God of the universe. So it is by no accident in verse two, it says the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. He lived in the house of his ma Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Didn't all the things that God promised to uh, his great grandfather, Abraham, didn't all come to pass? That God would be with him, that God would bless others, that he would bless the nations through Abraham's seed. And we realize that Potiphar's household is being blessed because of Joseph, Abraham's seed, because God was with him. And again, later on, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. God was with him, blessing him again. And even though Joseph has been dealt you know, terrible cards by people around him, that God was with him. God was blessing him. While others failed, God was faithful. You know, as we wrap up, I want to share a story with you. Uh, Somerset Maham, uh, the English writer, once wrote a story about a janitor at St. Peter's Church in London. Well, one day a young vicar discovered the janitor was illiterate. And as a result, he fired him. Well, jobless, the man invested his meager savings in a tiny tobacco shop where uh, he prospered, uh, bought another, expanded, and ended up with chain of tobacco stores worth several hundred thousand dollars. And so probably a lot more in today's money. Well, one day the man's banker said, you've done well for an illiterate, but where would you be if you could read and write? To that, his answer, well... I'll be the janitor of St. Peter's Church in Neville Square. That's where he would be if he was literate, right? So friends, God used Joseph's slavery as a training ground. God used Joseph's situation with his brother as a training ground. God used Joseph's situation as an attendant of Potiphar a manager of his household as a training ground. God used Joseph's unfortunate situation in prison as also a training ground. God in incrementally in continued to enlarge Joseph's responsibility and Joseph in these unlikely situation, a, a place where many people would have crumbled, he kept the faith and continued to seek the presence of the Lord and God used that as a training ground to prepare him to become a prime minister, a ruler of 
Egypt. Done pretty well for a slave boy. Done pretty well for a Hebrew boy in Egypt. Now, where would have been where would he been if he was never sold? He would have been just a shepherd boy. So, friends, I know life sometimes throws these challenges that you didn't invite, challenges that you didn't welcome. But I think God is speaking to us through Joseph's story that if we're faithful to God, because if God is faithful to us, you just never know how God will use those adverse situations to turn it for the good of God's kingdom, for the good of his saints, and for the good of others around them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God. Even when others are unfaithful, even when others can be cruel, terrible, betraying, thoughtless, selfish, egotistical, God, you are loving, you're merciful, and you're kind. We thank you, Lord God, that you have actively worked in Joseph's life to turn that adverse situation for the good of saving many lives. And we also pray now, Lord, that our evil that has come our way, that the evil would not have the final saying, but all these adversity that come our way, because the cost is so high, Lord, we ask that it will not go to waste, but that you would use this adversities, challenges to shape us, to mature us, and, and to polish us so that we may shine even more brighter for your kingdom, that we may grow a heart that is more soft, a heart that is more compassionate, empathetic, and a heart that is more hopeful, and a heart that is more resilient. Lord, we ask that you would do this for your namesake. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we are sent, we're reminded that God uh, not only calls us, tells us who he is and what he's done, and reminds us of who we are and what we are called to, but then God also sends us out to be his presence, to be his witnesses uh, of the love that we've experienced and encountered uh, in Jesus and so let's just read again from this passage in First Peter, this reminder of, of who God declares us to be and that we are then called to, to be a people who show mercy and love and, and care for those uh, in, in need in our communities. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Yes, that.
fruits of benediction as you go. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.